Every kingdom divided against itself shall be rendered desolate. Hernando Cortez, conqueror of the Aztec Empire. Most conversations about Mexico within the English-speaking world tend to revolve around its relationship with the United States. But I think that there's so much more to Mexico in and of itself. With a large population and landmass, one of the largest economies on the planet, and an incredibly rich history and culture, Mexico is worth paying attention to. And so on, the purpose of this video will be to assess whether or not Mexico is on the trajectory to become a great power by the end of this century. Let's have it a go. Before we try to understand Mexico's present and future, we must first understand its past. Mexico, or the land that it is composed of, was actually one of the very few places on the planet that formed civilization independently. The Olmec civilization emerged around 2500 BC, and little is known about them aside from these giant chubby faces they created. More obscure civilizations also emerged, like the Zapotecs and Toltecs, and most famously the Mayans who are still an ethnic group to this day, long after the famous classical civilization collapsed. These civilizations had their own advances in science, technology, art, and culture in their own right as much as the Spanish who conquered them would later want to deny it. The last of these civilizations were the Aztecs, who had conquered much of central Mexico, from their capital city Tenochtitlan in an island in the middle of a freshwater lake, now making up Mexico City. As most of you know, the Aztecs were known for their fierce warriors and human sacrifices. In the closest humanity has ever gotten to a science fiction plot, the Spanish arrived, led by Hernando Cortes, to conquer the Aztec Empire. The combination of guns, steel swords, horses and dogs, and most of all, disease, led to devastating consequences for the Aztec Empire as it crumbled beneath the weight of just a few hundred Spanish as well as their native allies who rallied with the Spanish against the Aztecs due to the Aztecs' brutal conquest methods. However, the Spaniards proved to be assholes as well. Through violence, disease, and subjugation, the Spanish suppressed the indigenous cultures, languages, religions, and practices. Many of the Spaniards ended up marrying the indigenous woman, leading to mixed children known as mestizos, which makes up the majority of the population today. This was in sharp contrast to countries like the US, Canada, and Argentina, in which the Europeans did not mass marry the indigenous people groups. And as a result, indigenous cultures play a far more important role in Mexico's culture than they do in those aforementioned countries. This is in part because Mexico had a long-standing history of complex civilizations, whereas North America and Southern South America did not. The Spanish would eventually move further north, going as far away up to what is now British Columbia, Canada, and setting up the foundations of many cities like Los Angeles and San Francisco. They would also head further south, to the dense rainforests of Central America, namely Panama and beyond. The Spanish would set up a highly aristocratic system that was very top-heavy, and this has led to many of the problems that Latin American countries face to this day. Spaniards born in Spain would be at the top of the hierarchy, followed by Spaniards born in Latin America known as the Creoles, followed by mestizos, mixed people, and then indigenous people at the very bottom of the hierarchy. For all of its horrors, this did produce a remarkable culture, as the two mixed. You had indigenous religion mixed with Catholicism, leading to Our Lady of Guadalupe and the Day of the Dead. The Creoles, Spaniards who were born in Latin America and were second-class citizens because of that, saw the successes of the American and French revolutions and held their own revolt against the people in Spain proper. And they won. This revolution, however, did not lead to a democracy or republic, but rather an empire. And this empire would eventually collapse as many Central American countries not liking the government of Mexico would leave. Texas would eventually break away in their own war of independence, and the United States would eventually conquer much of the Southwest in the American-Mexican War. This would understandably lead to Mexico treating the U.S. with some fair degree of suspicion. Internal affairs were also a mess, as a war between liberals and conservative Catholics broke out as well. The liberals won this conflict, however, the country was in massive debt to European powers, namely Spain, so Napoleon III wanted to get, bring back his money, and he invaded Mexico. However, the French forces were 
defeated at the Battle of Puebla, leading to the holiday of Cinco de Mayo. The French would be eventually kicked out completely, and this would lead to the United States exerting most of its control over Latin America, making sure that the Europeans didn't mess with its own backyard. Mexico had retained most of its sovereignty, however, it was still racked with corruption and poverty, which led to the Mexican Revolution, one of the most romanticized eras in Mexico's history, despite really being more of a civil war than a revolution itself. So much of Mexico's iconography comes from this era, and the Mexican Revolution has played a pivotal role in the collective Mexican imagination. The aftermath of the revolution did lead to some reforms and a new constitution, however, it also led to a one-party autocratic system under the Institutional Revolutionary Party. In the mid-20th century, Mexico played a minor role helping the Allies during World War II and stayed largely neutral during the Cold War, not bothering the US but not being an ally either. After the Cold War during the 90s, Mexico-US relations improved a lot, and the two opened up trade relations, namely through NAFTA. However, this led to a revolt by the Zapatista group of Mayan peoples, who believed that the Mexican farmers of Mayan descent could not compete with American and Canadian farmers. And in the year 2000, Mexico became democratic, as Vicente Fox defeated the old constitutional party guard. Now, moving on to Mexico's geography. Much of the northern region of the country, close to the U.S. border, is composed of arid deserts. This area is in many ways more closely tied to the United States than to Mexico City. And you can see this through the wide array of road networks that are more connected with American cities than central and southern Mexican cities. Likewise, southwestern states like Arizona and New Mexico have a profound influence of Mexican culture within their area. This area is unfortunately racked with a ton of violent crime and drug cartels, oftentimes catering to demand north of the border. Moving on to the East Coast, you have the Ciudad de Veracruz, or Veracruz City, which I am mispronouncing, which serves as one of Mexico's most important seaports, connecting the interior to the rest of the world. While the coastal portions of Mexico are fairly flat, the inland portions are very mountainous. In the central region lies Mexico City, a crop Aztec ruins and in the middle of a dried up lake along with other major population centers. In sharp contrast to the rest of the country, this is where Mexican authorities exert the vast majority of their power and influence. To the south lies the lush jungle region of Chiapas, with a majority indigenous population, and it's also the poorest region of the country, and many indigenous people view the central Mexican government with suspicion. Nearby, there's also the Yucatan Peninsula, which is a lush region famous as a tourist destination as it's the homeland of the Mayan peoples. Moving from land to water, the country borders two oceans, the Pacific and the Atlantic through the Caribbean. However, in spite of all of this, the country does face quite a lot of water scarcity and insecurity. Now let's move on to the economy. Mexico has a reputation as being a poor country because of its proximity to the United States, but in aggregate terms worldwide, Mexico is a middle income country and is one of the largest in the world. However, the country is mired in a lot of poverty in regional centers as well as a lot of income inequality as a small handful of families run a tremendous amount of wealth. And this has its roots in the autocratic system set up by the Spanish that I mentioned earlier. Regional poverty differences are also staggering as northern cities like Monterey have levels of wealth that are on par with many southern American states. However, on the other hand, there are parts of southern Mexico that have destitute poverty, especially indigenous populations. A common story about Mexicans is that they're lazy, but this is bullshit. Mexicans work some of the longest hours. However, their productivity is fairly low, and this isn't because they're lazy, but rather because the institutions they have in place are pretty lousy. Their currency, the peso, has ups and downs, including a pretty bad one during the 90s. However, the country does fairly well for itself. However, there are at the same time a lack of financial institutions in rural areas. Mexico is also an agricultural powerhouse, producing almost all of the world's avocados, as well as a lot of limes, chilies, chocolate, and vanilla. Many of these agro workers travel to the U.S. seasonally to work as well, bringing back remittances. 
lesser known as Mexico's manufacturing sector, which is growing at a rapid pace based off of low to medium skill labor, which in many cases complements the high skill manufacturing labor that you see in the US and Canada. Mexico also has a large service sector, especially in tourism, as it's one of the most visited countries on the planet. Its trade relations have also increased drastically, particularly in regards to the NAFTA agreement. NAFTA did have some exceptions though. The Mexicans did not want to have a free trade on oil. The Americans didn't want to have a free trade on the freedom of labor movement, given the illegal immigration problem. And the Canadians, being Canadians, did not want to have free trade when it came to softwood lumber, out of all of things. Immigration to the U.S. from Mexico long preceded NAFTA. Since the 1940s, vast sums of Mexicans have worked in the U.S. oftentimes seasonally and others staying permanently, playing a pivotal role in American economics and culture. As stated before, a lot of these come from seasonal workers in the agricultural sector and service sectors, and many of these people send back remittances, which uh, end up creating a tremendous amount of wealth on a family level. Mexico also has a very large informal economy as there are tons of side hustles as any tourist who has gone to Mexico could see street vendors and street musicians everywhere. The hustle is real and they ain't lazy. Speaking of the informal economy, I have to mention the drug trade, which is particularly common in the northern parts of the country and in these areas, the cartels oftentimes have more power and influence in the Mexican state itself including the police forces which are mired in corruption. In many cases, there's a great deal of hostility towards both these drug cartels and the Mexican state, and many Mexicans in this region tend to view both with a great deal of understandable suspicion. Speaking of people, demographics in Mexico actually look really good, one of the best in the world. Unlike some other countries like Russia or Japan or South Korea, Mexico's population is growing, which will provide a large youthful base of workers to support the elderly and to produce a lot of innovation and productivity. At the same time, Mexico's growth isn't so massive, right? and this rate is not so unsustainable like, say, the Indian subcontinents or sub-Saharan Africa's, making it an excellent case for a future great power on this level alone. Many of these young people will provide productivity to the economy, produce goods and services, and at the same time the elderly population won't be too much of a burden on them. This is especially good given that the other two major trading partners, the US and Canada, have some of the best demographics in the developed world, in sharp contrast to what you see in Europe and the richer parts of East Asia. So you basically have an incredible combination of excellent demographics from one of the developed countries, or two of the developed countries, as well as excellent demographics from one of the developing countries. The US and Canada's positive demographic trends tend to be due to their very powerful ability to attract and assimilate migrants, many of whom are actually from Mexico, more so in the US, but it's slowly reaching Canada. And this will result in more closer ties between the three nations, making sure that North America continues to be a hub of innovation and prosperity. Alas, this comes at a fault because its ethnic demographics are far more depressing. So much of Mexico's indigenous population is still mired in poverty and does not feel like they're one with the rest of the country and faces rates of standard of living that are just unfathomable to those in much of central and northern Mexico. This is compounded by the fact that the countries bordering Mexico to the south, like Guatemala, El Salvador, and a little bit further, Honduras, are racked with a tremendous amount of poverty, instability, and crime, and this could flow into the Mexican border. And this is part of the reason why Mexico, funny enough, has very strict immigration laws. Widespread movement of peoples from Central America, namely El Salvador, through Mexico to either a stay in Mexico or more likely land in the United States continues to be a pressing issue for both the Mexican and American governments. 
For this reason, Mexico has a problem controlling migration and crime across both its northern and southern borders, in large part due to its weak institutions and really pitiful police forces and border security in those areas. I would argue that corruption, if anything, plays a bigger role in crushing Mexican sovereignty than crime. After all, white-collar crime oftentimes contributes to violent crime as corruption within the police forces and other institutions prevents the police from actually taking drastic action when it comes to dealing with criminal activity. And this doesn't just mean drug cartels, it also means businesses. Legitimate, supposedly legitimate businesses. Carlos Slim, the telecommunications tycoon and the richest man in Mexico and one of the richest in the world, tried to move his businesses to the U.S. to engage in certain activities, but this failed due to certain legal restrictions. Certain things that go well and swimmingly in Mexico just are not allowed in the U.S. While us economic institutions oftentimes suck, there is one institution, if you could call it that, that does really well. It's culture. Mexico's music, food, festivities, and lore are renowned throughout the entire world. And this provides a set of glue, a sort of cohesion that unites the Mexican people and provides a certain degree of unity that Mexico's political and economic institutions could only dream of. Mexico's history and lore and culture are one of the most colorful in the world. And while this doesn't translate directly into raw military power or economic prosperity in dollars or pesos, it does provide a certain set of wealth. And because Mexico is in close proximity to the United States, Mexican culture has a profound impact on American culture. And because the United States is the foremost power when it comes to its own culture, this means that Mexican culture spreads worldwide via American culture, which in most cases I think is a good thing. However, it could lead to some bad things, namely Taco Bell. Yo quiero Taco Bell. <laughs> Speaking of power, it's important to be loved, but also feared at the same time. But Mexico's military isn't exactly to be feared, to put it lightly. Its Air Force and Navy are pretty pathetic, and its army is not that strong either. Granted, this isn't so much of an issue given the fact that Mexico resides in the Americas, and part of being in the Americas means that you're not as strategically vulnerable as countries on the Afro-Eurasian landmass are. So I'll give it a pass. If Mexico was located in the Middle East or in Eastern Europe, this would be a total disaster. But because it's located in the Americas, this is fairly okay. And on top of that, the United States seems fairly uninterested in attacking Mexico, at least not anymore since the 1800s. And furthermore, Costa Rica doesn't even have an army, so nothing to fear. Latin America has faced very few interstate wars. Oftentimes, militaries have been used to suppress their own populations rather than the populations of other nations. And most of the borders are located around natural barriers, making it very difficult to invade. And for this reason, I suppose it's not that big of a deal to have a kind of crappy military. So it doesn't hurt them that much. Nonetheless, we have to assess Mexico's potential great power projections. At the end of the day, Mexico is very unlikely to project any significant amount of power outside of its region. However, it still is a regional power, being far more powerful than any other Central American country. Like, sorry, if there's a fight between Mexico and Guatemala, I'm betting my money on Mexico for obvious reasons. Many of these Central American countries like El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala are racked with far greater issues than Mexico is dealing with. And much of their institutions are weak, and most of their economy is based off of exporting fruit. During the Cold War, the U.S. overthrew a whole bunch of democratically elected governments that were trying to produce land reform in the region. However, after the end of the Cold War, the CIA backed up a bit, allowing Mexico to be the head hegemon in the region. Other countries like Costa Rica and Panama have pretty good institutions and are relatively wealthy. However, they're too small to pose any significant amount of threat or even a challenge to Mexico for obvious reasons. As far as its northern neighbor is concerned, it has a friendly, yet not allied, relationship. 
staying fairly neutral when it comes to American military endeavors, however, deeply tied economically and culturally. Mexico has been arguably neutral, staying out of the affairs of major world powers, namely the United States, not joining NATO, not really engaging in American military adventures abroad for better or for worse, but at the same time never allying with American adversaries like Russia or China or more previously the Soviet Union, preferring to go it their own way. At this point, much of the hostility and suspicion of the United States has toned down. And they're no longer fearing the United States taking over their territory like the same way that Ukrainians would fear Russia taking over their territory. And this has led to a lot of economic and cultural cooperation, albeit not military or verbal political cooperation. Under NAFTA, the U.S. acts as the hub in a hub and spoke system, with Mexico and Canada being the spokes. Both Canada and Mexico have a love-hate relationship with the United States, whereas Canada and Mexico tend to view each other with nothing more than a shrug. Mexico has in many ways shifted as a bridge between the Anglo-North America and the Hispanic Latin America. And in many cases, I think that this is going to be a very successful strategy as Mexico is deeply rooted economically, culturally, politically, and historically with both of these spheres of influence. Mexico could also be a mediator between the United States and various regimes that are not so pro-American like Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Bolivia. However, outside of Latin America, Mexico's power projections are very, very limited. Mexico maintains friendly relations with its colonial overlord Spain, has spent several thousands of years to allow some healing. However, outside of Spain, there really isn't much in terms of a deep cultural and historic relationship or power projections outside of Latin America. However, there is one arguably far-fetched scenario in which Mexico does become a great power, namely if it unites with, say, the U.S. and Canada in some sort of union. There has been some very limited talk of the Amero, a North American unified currency kind of like the Euro. However, this has never led to anything significant in fruition. A monetary, let alone political union, would make the North American continent substantially more powerful as they'd be united. However, it could also lead to a gigantic mess in which you would have countries with very different institutions merging together into one. We've seen the mess that happened when you let Germany and Greece use the same currency, the euro. Now, what do you think would happen if the US and Mexico did it? Furthermore, losing some degree of your autonomy to a much larger, more powerful country that stole a big chunk of your land a century and a half ago would bring up its own fair share of grievances. So it would be laughable in the short term, but who knows, maybe a century from now it could be totally plausible. A North American Union would be very unlikely in the near future or even the medium future, but who knows, maybe within the next century when there's more integration and maybe less grievances and general trajectories towards integration, well, maybe it's at the very least plausible. So in conclusion, I don't think Mexico is going to be a great power. However, I do think that we should pay it more respect as a potential power on the world stage. Mm -hmm.